Okay, so I'm the panel host. My name's Sean Connors, and I'm joined by Addison and Ben. Uh, we're all GMs, and the ideal, the idea behind this panel, really, or this, this, if you want, GMing, examining the art of GMing, really, is to for us to share some of our experiences. I'm going to pose questions to Addison and Ben. They're going to give me their perspective view on that question. I'll chip in at the end while I think, and you'll notice a lot of us, a lot of the time we might agree, we might disagree, um, and we may not agree on a lot of things, and that's perfectly okay. It doesn't mean that anybody's right or wrong, and that's the most important part to come from at the beginning of this. There isn't really a right or wrong answer, but there are an awful lot of ways you can approach this subject, and some of them we really quite quickly gloss over and forget about, and they're actually really irrelevant, and that's what this is all about tonight. I'm hoping that my questions will challenge both Addison and Ben. But before we get into the questions, why don't we find out a little bit about them? So if we start with Addison, tell us a bit about Addison, your experience as a GM, how long you've been doing it, and the kind of systems you like, enjoy, kind of games that you like to do. Uh, so yeah, I'm mainly um, d and 5e. I've started dabbling in Mutants and Masterminds, which okay. is, is a pretty yep. cool system. Um, but I've been doing it for... It's got to be coming up to two, three years now. I started right uh, running with t uh, running it with uh, kids with special educational needs at my school that I work at, and then uh, very valuable, club. very valuable. Yeah, that's a that's a great set of uh, that's going to bring in some really interesting skills to the hobby. So brilliant that is. Has it always been D and D fifth? Just for the audience listening in. Um, it was, there was a very small time when I was a kid, like where I played three point five. And okay. then um, when I come back into it, um, the, it was mainly fifth. I've I've never touched fourth, um, but three three point five, the the tiniest bit of Pathfinder before it blew okay. my mind. Yeah, then... that's good. I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up because we might be looking at some different things like that tonight. So that's really good. Thank you, Addison. That's really good. Mm -hmm. So a lot of experience that's there. Now we got Ben. Ben, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, I'm Ben. I've been playing since the Dungeon Master's Guide came out for 5th edition. Uh, quickly ran out of patience with that. Um, I like <laughs> my games, uh, you know, more rules as rulings than rules as red. So uh, yeah. I keep keep going over different systems and try to find the one. I, I haven't found it yet, but we're getting pretty close yeah. with uh, our yeah. Lord and Savior okay. Forbidden Lands back there. Um, I'm really into all the indie scene. Uh, you, you look like RPG a typical. And everything. You do look like a typical DM there, Ben, because that shelf will fill with lots of different systems. You may never find exactly the one you're looking for. Let me tell you. That this is a new bookshelf because I filled the. La <laughs> I, I couldn't get them all in the last one. Um, That's so, good. And, and yeah. you play. You play a lot as well as DM, don't you? Yeah, I mean. I don't want to get stuck as the forever GM, so every okay. time someone's like, I'm going to run a game, I'm like, I'm going to play that game as long as it's not one of the one of the systems I try and avoid. So it it's something hard. new, I'm, I kind of jump in, you know? Yeah, it is hard, isn't it, to get people into DMing is one of the hardest things for lots of reasons, you know? So it's, it is hard. We will talk on that a little bit, but for this is going to be a three or four part series, so this will be part one. I want to kick it off with the first question. We'll start with Addison on this question. And I'll, it's, a, it's a very... It's a very interesting way of looking at the hobby, really. What's more important to you? And I mean, what's more important? Not, don't try and come at this as a kind of try and everything's important. Try and think about what's more important out of this question. Is it the system, the players, or the DM? What's the most important thing in your view? Ooh. I'd, I'd like to start with an easy question, obviously, as you can yeah. see. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, I, would, uh, I would say players, personally. I would, per I great. Would... Right. I'd be, why, why would you pick them out? What's your reasoning for picking the players out? Could you elaborate a little bit on what? Because, why? because the players are the people who are going to experience your system, and as a DM, you need them to help you create the scenarios that are going to happen. So, therefore, um, yeah. without them, there is no DM really, and without the DM, there's no system because there's nobody to run for. So, I feel yeah. as if players are the most important. Because they are typically, anyway, um, the people who are who are giving you that feedback and helping you build that uh, that scenario. Whereas um, DMs mm, sometimes think themselves really important, and I don't think that's true. Like I think if everybody's on a, f a level playing field, so yeah, I would say players. 
personally. Fabulous. Great answer. Thank you very much. Addison Ben, same question, of course, to yourself. <sighs> oh, we're going to start with something controversial straight away. Yeah, um, the GM is a player, and so that all the players are equally important. I have played in games with shitty GMs, with great players who I've later gone on and run for, and we've all had a great time. I've played in games where I didn't really mesh with the players. They weren't bad players. I, my style just and their style were, were different things. I think so if you yeah. count yourself as a player, everyone around that table needs to be having a good time, or no one around that table is going to have a good time. Very pleased you've t- both touched on something very important. We'll, you'll, you'll notice we'll be coming back to some of these points brilliantly, so thanks for that. Well, my perspective is very similar to yours, Addison. I'm no different than you. Look, there are more players than there are me as a GM. Now, obviously, I'm a GM, and I think all GMs, we're opinionated, we're difficult, we're not easy, but we realise, if we're honest, that there are more players than there are of us, and if we don't put them first, we haven't got a game. So you're absolutely right. You know, in my view, if we don't put them first, I, I really got to understand them. Now, I'm not taking anything away from the art of DMing at all with this answer, because I know how important I am to the game to make it fun. Because, you know, obviously I've got to bring life to those encounters. I've got to bring life to those NPCs. I've got to make that game work for that play, those players around my table. How you go about that is a completely different set of skills, which I'm sure these DMs will touch on as we go through some of the more deeper questions. So thank you both for your perspective. Brilliant answers, i got to tell you straight away. And I, I do understand. And I, I mean, look, to be honest, Ben, if we, you know, that answer you gave is exactly right. You know, you could argue that all of them have a value and, you know, are equally relevant. It's very interesting. So here's, here's the interesting thing, though. Let's just open this up a little deeper. Now, just think about this for a second. Okay. So how much focus do you actually put then on the system, the players, and yourself? Being honest, just think about it for a second. So if you flip the question round for a moment, how much do you really focus on the system, the players, and yourself? Because if you think about it, you've kind of touched on some things that are really interesting. Because depending on what you've run or looked at, you know, like yourself, Addison, you looked at, for a moment, Pathfinder, and you thought, Ugh, you know, you kind of, weren't nope. that keen, right? Nope. And I understand why. You know, I've run a lot of Pathfinder, I do get it. So I kind of understand. But realistically, how much do you focus do you put on these things before going into every session, being honest? Because what me and you have both said, our focus is on the players. But do we really focus on the players or are we focusing on the story we're about to run and what are we really doing? So just have a think about that, the flip of the question. How would you answer it? Go with Ben first. So how much? I mean, the system is is way in the back for me. I think I've already uh, said that. Um, yeah, we you can play anything, and as long as everyone around the table kind of knows that we're gonna come up with the most the most amicable solution of how to roll a thing, I think everyone's gonna have a good time. Like you can play a really crunchy game with a group that hates crunch, and you, you as the GM can strip all that out, and everyone's gonna have a good time. Um, I think I focus a fair amount on, I guess you would call it the GM, there's like session plan, Mm -hmm. Um, but in between all those sessions, like, I think you always sort of have to look at what the characters have given you and see if you can work that into the session you're about to run. Like, if you want to do a heist in in the next game, you as a GM might think, oh yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about a heist. If you've got something from a player's backstory that you can think, oh, I'll, I'll pull that in, and then everyone will want to do the heist. I think, like, I definitely put more emphasis on me as a GM planning, but if you can bring all that player stuff in, it really helps the, the game flow. In, that's great. Addison, yeah, what's your thoughts? Um, so, if I was to put it in percentages, I think that's, if we say 100% is the whole game, and you've yeah. got to split that 100% between, I would actually go 60% player... Uh, 30% system and 10% me because one of the things that I'm 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 uh, lauded for I suppose I don't mean to sound like uh, obnoxious but like one of the things that people really like about my games is I'm a very character focused uh, storyteller so like I I take a lot of note about the players backstories and then find a way to make that happen and make things happen and then pretty much what ben was saying there you pretty much do yeah 
Right. And then and then the system, uh, it, mainly for for some rulings and uh, things that I can like shimmy. Like if I know the system well, I can also break it and then not break it. If that makes sense, like I can I can bend a rule to the point where it doesn't break the game and stuff like that. So I'm I like to know the system quite well so I can do that rather than sit there with a like going through a book and be like I don't know what to do here like so understanding the art form to be able to break the rules of the art yeah perfect great okay yeah um it yeah my focus is very similar to yours to be perfectly honest with you the, the truth is you have to be honest i mean look depending on the system it could require a lot of your gm focus you can waste an awful lot of time as gms on the system we just talked about how it should be in the background as ben highlighted brilliantly but actually, depending on the system, we'll talk a bit more about systems later, um, it, it can use up a lot of your time. You can spend a lot of your time away from the key focuses, whether that's yourself developing yourself or whether that's developing the player's storylines, which Addison and both Ben highlight. I agree with them entirely. And if I was breaking the percentages down, I don't think it might be too different to Addison. And I guess the proof is in the pudding. Ben will be able to sort of say, because he's been in the game that we tend to run. I put a lot of energy into those characters being focused for story. Yeah, I might have some ideas that I like, but you know, I, if if I don't think they're going to fly, I'd rather give the players the option that you know, if you, this is this is what's here, and let them decide what they want to do. So I'm with you 100 percent there, Anderson. That is a great answer. Same Ben, brilliantly answered, guys. And it really then becomes very interesting because as we then open this can of worms up, because I've thrown a very interesting curveball first question in, and then we've delved a little deeper. Here comes the next thing that's quite tricky then, because me and you have both said, you know, we you know, we tend to focus very heavily on the players. How do you focus on the players? Because that'd be the question I would next ask you. We'll start with you, Addison, because how do you personally focus on your players? What sort of tips would you give anybody listening in about how you would go around doing it? it doesn't have to be anything grand scheming, but what kind of things do you like to do as a GM to focus on and how do you do it? Do you have a system in play? that you kind of work out how they work. I mean, obviously you can't do this in the first few seconds of meeting the players. You might have a snapshot of them, but obviously that will come as each session on rolls. But how do you go about doing it? I think the main way I do it is one, I, I, I read their backstories, whether they're 30 pages or one, like I read them and we will edit them. Like I, I come from a creative writing background, so I'm, uh, uh, I'm very good at editing and cutting stuff out when it's not my work. Um, but also as well, I think my main system is letting them know that their choices affect the world around them for for greater or worse sort of thing. So um, if you, so if we use Ben's heist example, if you succeed in this heist, people are going to talk about it and yeah. they're going to like want to know who pulled it off and people are going to like look for you and that might not be what you want right now, but that's what's going to happen. And then, so, so the, that, the consequences of the actions are always there in your game. Yeah, and like, and not, and not just consequences, because that, then there's that idea of people feeling like they're being punished for yeah, no, doing but, something. But um, people might have heard of it, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, and also as well, like the reward. So like, um, if you, if again, Ben's heist idea, if if you succeed and someone you didn't like was in charge of security like some somebody who you thought was a massive dick and needed to get out of the way they get fired and then now the 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 job is a lot easier you've got somebody who you might like as the now the captain of the guard or whatever and you might be able to like influence them in a different way than this guy who was a bit of a jackass so i feel as if that's that's my main stratagem for investing in my players is letting them know from the offset as well like for session one they'll do something and somebody will be like like somebody will be like well that happened like an hour ago and so that idea of like you are affecting the world around you is the main issue like the main right. uh, yeah. strategy okay that's good Ben your thoughts so, uh, how we focus on players, usually in my game, when everyone sits down, I ask them, each player, to come up with a negative uh, and a positive relationship to one of the other characters. So we already have that kind of tension, but also like everyone kind of knows each other in the party and they've got good things and bad things to say about each other. So I kind of yep. like focusing on that drama, and then if you can find a way to like 
team the negative people up together, I think that's uh, like a, a fun dynamic that you can play out. Um, I also like to give the players enough rope to hang themselves with. If they find a demon, the demon's not going to want to fight them straight away. He's going to be like, guys, let me out. Come on. You know, yeah. I, I don't, I don't want to fight you. Let me out. And then he's going to take over the local lake, flood all the towns that you are going shopping in. Uh, and then you've got to deal with that consequence. You know, I think actions having consequences, just like Addison said, is the biggest thing that separates our hobby from just playing a computer role playing game where like Skyrim, your actions have consequences, but there's only so many consequences they can have. And that, that can only branch out so much. But the cool thing about our hobby is anything they do can can come back. Like, if they help the old beggar, I can keep that in the back of my mind and then I can be like, I, you know what? He was supposed to be this, this little character, but they decided they took a really big liking to him. They've come back. Um, I'm going to say that maybe this guy was a wizard the whole time. Um, I think letting... Letting the things that the players take interest in become the things that you take interest in is sort of the way to get the players the most involved. Okay, great. Okay, so um, I do it a little differently as an approach. Um, obviously, it's based over a number of years of, of GMing. Uh, I kind of start working out what the player types are that I've got in my games, whether it's a snapshot, one-off session, or whether it's a long-term campaign. So have you ever considered um, that players fall into certain types? Have you ever oh yeah, archetypes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's 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 a couple like the like the like the lone wolf who always goes off and splits the party and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah there are seven there are seven key archetypes. I mean, I think it's worth us sort of discussing them because I think it's really useful for GMs that are the kind of new to the hobby and are coming in and kind of working out strategies to do what you're saying. And I think this is a good way to look at it. So, um, and the, I'm just going to use words that I would use for them. There are different words people use, so you know, and they get referred to in negative light. Some of these these types, which we'll talk about in a moment, you've got kind of the butt kicker. Some people refer to them as murder hobos, which is actually wrong, but they're called butt kickers. People who like to just basically knock the door down, take names, and just get stuck into the action. That's fine. We can think about that in a minute. We'll talk about that in a minute, a bit more detail. You've got tacticians. You've got casual gamers. You've got power gamers, you've got a specialist, somebody who specializes in a particular role, method actor, and, and basically the storyteller. So all of those, depending on the players you've got, players will fall into. Um, do you feel, in the games that you have, do you, do you naturally, instinctively feel that you, without, do, without really specializing in any time in it, do you kind of work out what boxes players tick? Because really good players tick multiple boxes. They really do. And it's not negative if somebody only ticks one box. It just it gives you more options as the GM to help focus them. Do you think about those things psychologically, or is it just something that happens in the background when you run games? And we'll start think, with Ben. Yeah, I think it's definitely much more of a, a background thing. I'm, I'm not going to sit and write notes about, uh, I think this player is, is X, Y, and Z. If you sort of know where those players like derive their enjoyment, you can definitely set up specific encounters or what have you for that specific player and play to yep. those strengths but I don't think it I can't ever see it being like a conscious decision for me to be like this player is XYZ because that's kind of not how my brain works so that yeah. wouldn't be helpful for me planning but like those those types of players definitely do exist Can you, um, can you just hold that thought about it wouldn't be useful to your planning Just just hold that thought in your mind okay as we d dive into this a bit deeper, just want you to hold it there because that's really interesting. So, yeah, Addison, what, what are your thoughts further on these player types? I think that um, when I said about like reading their backstories, I feel as if the characters that people create create are very indicative of those um, yeah of those player types. Yep. So, much like Ben, um, I don't I don't uh, plan for it, but I I do keep a note of things such as so uh the tactician might also love puzzles and so uh yes. or like yes. that. so like yeah yep. um every now and then i've got to throw something in that they will enjoy and stuff like yep. that um because the the only the only reason why i'm wary of those player types is because there are some that interact negatively with each other so for example right the, yep. the storyteller and the and the butt kicker um, usually have uh, a very 
odd relationship because the storyteller's there monologuing and then uh, I can almost imagine it in a film where like one character's like monologuing and then in the background you can just see the like the butt kicker like killing everybody in the background and then by the time the storyteller turns back round they're like where is everybody and the murder hobo or whatever you want to call them they're like yeah I, I fixed the problem I'm, I'm good so there can be contention so I, I like to keep that in eye yeah okay well let's go a little deeper into this okay because it's an interesting area for those that are watching to have a think about right so Give me your interpretation. You, you kind of hinted on one there about your feelings around, we'll call them the butt kicker. What is your sort of interpretation of them, if I was to use that phrase? If a character fell into that that kind of mould, for you, Ben, what would that look like? You know, just as a, as a feeling, an instinct, what kind of, what sort of player would fall into that? Of the butt kicker? Um, someone who typically their characters don't have anything in, in charisma or wisdom or any kind of... Um... I guess utility skills you might call them like they're there to have a good time killing things i have those in my game a lot uh i think they're sometimes some of the more fun characters because you know you if you get the butt kicker in an rp situation i choose my players like pretty carefully i i run a home game i don't uh i don't really go to the club anymore i kind of like curate my players so all of my players kind of get that if you come to the game, you know, if you're not doing something that is necessarily the one thing that you always want to do, like, we're still going to have a good time. You Like, every dog has its day, right? So I think, like, the butt kicker is a really interesting one to interact with because if you put them in a room and there's no way of fighting the way out, like, how, how do they react? I think um, you don't necessarily... As much as it's... It's cool to play to their strengths. I think sometimes it's equally as cool to do the opposite of what their their player type is. So I I don't I don't think there's any like negative connotation to to someone who wants to go kill things because you know I, we all like to just veg out on the sofa and watch an action movie from time to time. People you know? people come to your games for different reasons. They, they may not necessarily. I mean, what Addison hinted at there was great. That could be the extreme where you've got one person trying to. Uh, talk through the situation, monologue it, and then you've got another person who's just literally killing everybody that's lying on the ground because that's what they want to do. And you are right, it can create confusion and contention. And, you know, it is something you have to kind of wear. A lot of new GMs kind of struggle with some of the different or opposite player types. They will struggle with these. And if you imagine the player types, kind of the best way of imagining it is a GM's journey. Okay, so it's kind of a circle. It doesn't matter where you start on that journey. We all come at it at different points. And in the middle, it's kind of a balance that sits right in the middle of that circle. And on that balance are these player types. Right in the middle, you've got the casual game. At the very extreme, you've got the method actor storyteller. On the other extreme, you've got the power gamer and the butt kicker. You can run games with all these types in it, but it requires an awful lot of skill and a lot of careful working out. And I would argue system really matters if you consider this these types just think about it for a moment think about this we'll come to this in a minute but it will matter quite a lot depending on what you're using will have an impact massively on these guys the tactician you talked about addison momentarily which was very interesting you you to talk about them in a very uh i like your the way you described it I, i sometimes i've seen very extremes and some interesting differences with this kind of player type um, so I've seen the historical history buff realist who really understands because, you know, they've actually gone out and reenacted it. You know, they really know, yeah. it, you know, and they want to see that kind of realism within reason within your game, understanding it's a fantasy game, obviously, and they're not going to get exactly what they want. But they want to feel that your game does account for some of those things that they're interested in. And sometimes very tactically, you know, militarily, the way they approach something or perhaps they come up something from a very obscure angle they want to see that your game isn't just a b c it does have variations and you will allow them sometimes the scope to succeed you know those kind of things how did you feel about tacticians ben because addison's description was very interesting what about that type of player someone who's very much into like maybe the puzzles that side of the game and those tactics tacticians are like really a, a fun challenge in your game because they will know things that you just straight up didn't know. They're usually the, the player who can 
Uh, they'll ask you five seemingly unrelated questions, and then follow it up with a sixth one, where you finally see all of their Sherlock logic slot beautifully into place. They're usually the guys whose characters are making Semtex in their bathtub, and you didn't know until, you know, the big heist is about to start, and they can take out the wall. I I relish the challenge of, of the tactician, because that is way more cinematic than like any other like I think they often that's... give you the best ideas as a GM yeah with some of the best ideas yeah. like they're they're the um another way to look at them is the logician like the logician yeah. like they're very logical they're like they're because that's what that's how I started when I first started playing it's like um I came from martial arts background right fell okay. up with the yeah. monk yeah and then therefore I understood things like um uh tactical wise like um we one of the first things i ever saw was um one of the first combats i was ever in was in a really in in tight space and so the first thing my character did was put his back up against the wall right like why have you you done that i'm like because no one can now get behind me like and now i can fight everybody off because they're all technically in front of me and um like uh there was the thing of like if i grapple someone and i move them they're now yep. up against the wall with me, and so and all they're in front of me, and so um, I I I I very much relate as a player, even though now I'm the forever GM. Like um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel I'm, the same. Yeah. I'm very much the tactician. So I, I learned a lot through people who are tacticians as a GM. I, one of my favourite ones is a chap called Gareth, who's an architect, and his knowledge of reading a dungeon plan made me realize when I did something ridiculously stupid as a GM that I need to cut that crap out and actually make it so that somebody with skill can read a map, look at it, not always get exactly what you're trying to do. But if it has logic and thought behind it, then you don't even need a dice roll. So the beauty is, you know, someone can see a bend in a corridor, a hundred foot corridor, bend in the corridor, and it seems out of place and go, right, we're going to stop here now. We're going to just check this out before we move any further. This doesn't look right. That I found incredibly useful to my games. It, it cut out a lot of stuff that and fluff, so we weren't searching every five feet, you know. And it really helped me as a GM and a young GM to kind of go further and deeper into the game. So d- just worth mentioning here because you've brilliantly highlighted both of you, the tactician. What about a casual gamer? Have you ever had a casual gamer in any of your games at all? Yeah, in and my current. You... you go first, Ben. Oh, thank you. Uh, in my current bitter reach, about half of our guys are all like casual gamers. They they haven't played before. They're kind of yep. they're there along for the ride. But if you can give them that spotlight moment, they like really shine. Um, I know a lot of people kind of a, a few people have like a problem with the casual gamer because they think yeah. D- that d- maybe tell they us can't. what kind of problems people might have with them. Just again for the audience. So I know that. St- some people think those casual gamers because they're usually not the ones who are going to come with you like a bunch of backstory and they they're, they're kind of they can be hard to fit in the game but like as long as you ask them between sessions like oh what are you enjoying about it you can slot that in and then give them their moment to shine um, right yeah yeah great I like that okay what about yourself Addison encountered these kind of players uh I live with one she's my wife. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, she. So Jen's a good for, uh, a good model for this because of the fact that she plays and she's not as like into it as I am. But when she has her moments and when she has her failures as a player, that's when she gets hyped up either way. And then that that thing of like, why can't I get it to work? And yeah, I'm awesome. And I quite like that about the casual game. I like that. I like seeing them like i like seeing them enjoy themselves because it's like it's not like the people who would who like us who have played the game for ages and will sit there and sit there and play even when sometimes we're there like oh i'm really not liking this i really wish i could walk away but i know like deep down in my heart that that's not okay to do um uh, in terms of um etiquette and stuff like that and like the unwritten rules of D D. whereas um casual gamers they don't have those like um those roadblocks in their way so they're very honest and i appreciate that i appreciate their like honesty like ben said they will tell you you know what like that npc sucked like i, I just couldn't get on with him and it's like yeah yeah, yeah. 
oh, awesome. Like, and then I can get rid of him because I didn't like him either. Like, he was just yeah. there. Like, so it was, it was, I like casual gamers. I think but that they're. I, I, they're I often, needed. I often refer to this as the Steve rule. Now, if he was here, I've got a very good friend of mine called Steve, Stephen Reynolds, and he's been in our gaming group for 40 years. So I've known him since he was the same age as me. And, um, Steve, absolutely for probably half that time for 20 years i honestly i couldn't tell you I, I, because my experience was poor at that point you know it, it was you got to understand for those listening in when we started gming there was no internet i know it makes me sound really old um there's no internet there's no um nobody you could rely on the the code of the gm it was like the magician nobody told you anything they weren't going to share their secrets with you um, I decided long time when I first started jumping into it, I'd break that straight away. My, my, my main goal was to teach everybody if they wanted to learn, teach them and, and help them. And I've stuck with that all the way through. Now, what Steve did, which is fascinating, is I honestly can't tell you for the first many years, actually, why he came. I, I didn't know if this guy was socially depressed, whether he had problems, whether he had no friends. I, I didn't get it. I couldn't work out what he wanted. If I asked him like Ben said, you know, what are you enjoying, Steve? It's a... I just like coming. I say, well, you know, specifically, what is it, Steve, that you like? I like being there. I mean, thanks, Steve. That's great. And another week ago by, and I think, I don't know why he comes. I really don't. But what Steve did, which is absolutely fantastic for our group, he was always there. He was always on time. He never upset everybody. He was the perfect foil between the various difficult player types. He never created arguments. He solved a lot of them. And I think Steve brings a calmness to a group and over time as you say ben you're able to eventually if you're very lucky you open them up and they become a different player they become a different player type eventually i don't always start you know they might start casual probably like your wife start as a casual game and then eventually they're uh, they kind of flourish into different avenues that they go on to and they can become the best the best person in a group by a long way they can bring in so much stability and in time you realize like i did with steve and one of the best comments he ever made was i wouldn't come if i didn't enjoy myself i think that's all you need to hear sometimes player is that um so yeah, definitely. You know, that's a really I, good thing and and i like that about the casual gamers and you've highlighted it both of you exceptionally well let's talk about the power gamers often given negative light by some gms what's your experience of power gamers I'll start with Addison. I, I, I struggle with this one because I feel as if there's two types of power gamer. There's the dude yeah. who wants the highest scores. And to be honest with you, yeah, my, my like autistic brain goes, that's just obvious. Like, yeah. Yeah. that's kind of how you would want it to be. Like, I, I sack stuff off when I build characters because there's a there's a reason or something like that. Um, but I also feel as if there's, there's another type of power gamer who's the person who like crowbars stuff in to make it fit. They're usually okay. the person who multi-classes stuff that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Like, there is no logic nor connection or anything between what they... It's built for... With. You're saying it's built purely for the min-maxing part of the... Power. Yeah, the, the, yeah the, the, the mechanics of it. So, like... Um, and there'll be, like, one piece of text that loosely links the... Um, links the uh ideas together and you're just there like i uh, i've had it quite recently actually where i just stared at something and was just staring at it for ages like i don't get how this works and i don't and in the end i had to say like i can't it, it i can't allow it like it's the first time i've ever had to say no because i'm just like this doesn't this makes no sense the answers that you're giving me in terms of like your and the backstory you've given me uh just do not fit what you've asked to have like it, it's not it's not compatible so that and then i felt really bad uh, so i think there's two there's there's the 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 highest that there's the min maxer yeah. and then there's the, there's the mechanical crowbar like like yeah. oh i really want this ability so i'm going to put it in there shoehorn it into there somehow and i don't i don't find it negative but i do i'm like i do find it difficult and that's that's a new thing that i've discovered and that's something that I'm really. Um, you struggle it's with it. First, it's the first hurdle I've found in a long time. Let's say. Like, I like. I like your honesty. I really appreciate it, Ben. What's your perspective of power gaming? And I think you... that's. Uh, sorry, what was that, Sean? I'm just saying. What's your perspective on them? How do you kind of um, 
make them work within your games? How does it work for you? I don't. I've, I don't think I've ever had a power game. My, so because oh, I've well, refused that's... to run popular systems right. because okay, I'm a yeah, massive so hipster. You... I get it. I, I get never it. get them. So you don't get them. All right, okay, brilliant. Now that highlights something very important. You see what you've touched on. We'll talk about this more in a minute. System matters here. I mean, just again, bring it back to this for a second. You know, a power gamer, given Pathfinder, are they happy or sad? Happy. There's happy. so much you can power. Game. Yeah, there, happy, there's, happy. there. So many you, numbers. Right, you give a storyteller Pathfinder, happy or sad? Sad because they yeah. can't do what they can want to do. So it, like. it has a massive impact. So you just think about this for a minute. We'll, we will talk on this, but just have this burn in the back of your mind here because I'm going to talk about power gamers. Just think about that quick th- thought for a moment, particularly with these player types, because you know everything, every choice we make as a GM, everything we do, it has an impact on the players around us. Is why I, I say, my, you know, me and you have both said the same here, Addison. Absolute focus players. So system choice. Like Ben's done the brilliant thing. He said, you know what? These are the systems I'm going to run as a GM. And you know that's pretty obvious because if you say to someone, hey, I'm running Forbidden Lands. Even if you didn't know when you went away and did a bit of research, you'd realise pretty quickly it's not a game for min-maxers. Um, it's more theatrical. It's more theme and tone kind of game. So you kind of probably not like this to see them, which you highlight brilliantly there in your answer. So well done. Very intriguing. Now, let me tell you something about power gamers, okay? Um, you know, you get them in games. Um, and they're very, you know, they're, it's a play style like every other play style. Perfectly valid. Nothing wrong with it. You know, it, I can't, I can't, for one minute, I, I have no problem with power gamers purely because of this reason. Do not give me Pathfinder as a GM. Don't let Pathfinder come into my remit as a GM and don't let me GM Pathfinder for you because you will hate me as a GM because I can outlock any of these power gamers by using the very rules that they cherish against them, specifically, specifically by the rules. And that is horrendous as a GM because now it becomes this chess match between me and these wonderful power gaming people and they hate you for it but they love you for it too because for the first time they've really been challenged about how they actually run a game but the problem is it requires a lot of energy it requires a lot of extra additional work and it's a style of play i really have fallen out of love with so i like ben i've been very careful of you'll notice a lot of my choices i've avoided particularly in recent years, you know, Cthulhu, I, you know, Vampire the Masquerade, uh, Forbidden Lands, specifically for this reason, because the one choice I have as a GM, without being selfish, is if I choose the system and my idea for the story, then I, the players have the choice. If you want to come along and you're a power gamer and this is the system we're running, to be honest, and we're going to tell you straight off what kind of game it's going to be and the players are going to tell you. So if you realize within a session or two it's not for you, that's fine if you want to walk away. It's not a problem because at least we've saved a lot of heartache for ourselves. Equally, if you want to come into the game and try to min-max it, you're welcome to, but the games aren't designed for you to get the maximum of implemental results. So it, it's a style of play, and unfortunately, a lot of systems cater for it. Now, this is where it's really interesting. Now, you've said, interestingly, Ben, sorry, Addison, you run a lot of 5th edition. That could be a very min-max system, couldn't it? With the wrong players in it. Realistically, it could be, couldn't it? Have you encountered, is this frustration that's kicked in a little with some of the power games, is this something you've recently seen as a style of play that certain people love to get the maximum out of their character? For them, the moment their character levels is a critical moment for them. Have you... Uh, have you yeah. Seen? Yeah, there's there's that. Um, like, I, do, I don't mind the numbers guy. Like, I don't mind the numbers guy. Um, uh, I think, uh, like I said, if you're if you're an adventurer and you've been training, because adventurers by them by their nature are special in D and D. Like they're not they're not a townsfolk with four HP. Like they have trained, and therefore they would probably be at the optimal. Like, I don't mind that guy who's got those stats. Uh, like like I was saying, I, I what I've struggled with recently because it's the first time I've really encountered it is are these people who make characters and like shoehorn as much as they can in terms yep. of like cross classing and yeah feats and uh, and that is that is annoying. I will admit like um, to the point where I I've never ever uh, I've never ever considered more than recently to ban multi classing outright. Okay, interesting. Okay, because it's of a the fact that rule, it, right? 
it's it's just i didn't use i didn't used to hate it but like as soon as somebody goes can i cross class into this there's now like a shiver of dread because i now have to read what skills they have what skills they're going to get do are you they then, fit together? are you are you then concerned as a gm that they're they're kind of uh that this cross-classing of the characters is is does it start to make you a bit more worried about how that balances with the other characters around them and you're a bit more concerned about that does that come into this a little bit as an equation yeah yeah and also as well like that idea of like is it natural so if so we've been we've had seven sessions for some reason you've decided to cross class after seven sessions i'm quite a liberal dm with my level ups because i i like to throw bigger monsters at people as sessions go on yeah Yeah. bigger challenges so i let them level up quite quickly yeah but if you go so say you're a cleric and you go cleric and you're like there throughout these seven sessions and on session seven you level up and you go to me you know what addison i would really like to go into ranger i'm like okay i'm like why and they're like just like it i'm like we have been running in a city for the last like seven sessions you've you've never once your your god is the god of study like what what where where do you where where are you becoming a a, like a this survivalist where where's that coming from and it, it usually when it comes down to it, when it boils down to it, there's like one thing they want. There's like one tiny thing. One key and then, skill, one key yeah, skill, special and, yeah. okay. and then and then they'll move on to the next thing and the next thing until you've got this like Voltron of like um, I'm gonna call it what it is, this Voltron of bullshit, where you're just like, I can't I I don't I don't care anymore. Like what we've heard there is some very interesting perspectives and this is an area where Ben he's been sorry. Addison has been very clear over this is an area that's now starting to, as a GM, and it's a personal thing. Everybody has a different job. We all have struggles along the way, which a lot of people don't see. Players don't often see the struggles GM goes through. So it's actually very useful because as these videos go forward, as we go through the panel, we will come back to this a little bit more and we will talk around some of the methods that I, I've i used personally to give those players the kind of game they're looking for and the kind of tips that I can impart I find really useful that help you, hopefully help you to get around some of the ways you can handle those kind of guys. But it does require you locking horns with them, I'm afraid. And it's the best way to to show your mastery of the system is through the system itself. And one of the interesting parts of that is what I would call one of the dangers you see is homebrewing rules. I think it's worth bringing in here because um, a temptation for a lot of GMs. You see, there are systems. We've all got systems we enjoy playing, GMing. But I guess the temptation is maybe you bringing in homebrew rules of your own. Do you do that? Uh, and like, Is that something you do, Addison and Ben? Do you bring in um, homebrew rules a lot? Or do you let the system take care of it for you? How do you feel around any kind of homebrewing? Is that something you do a lot of or very minorly? What do you normally do? It depends how you define homebrew rules. Your personal rules, for whatever reason that you decide to use, not alternatives or options, those are within the mechanics, but say something that you, say in your case here, Addison, there's a great point. You might say, in this campaign, there is no multi-classing. Now, that's a perfectly acceptable you know, take from a GM because you've struggled with it. Is that something you might consider doing going forward, homebrewing that as an example? I'll let Ben go first because I, I went a bit off on my... Uh, That's a- well, bullshit thing. So it's all right. It was, it was good. Um, that was good. Tangent. Yeah. yeah. Um, I again, I'm a big rules as rulings, not rules as rules, uh, rules as red kind of guy. So um, I, I won't. I like to work with my players to kind of find the most sensible, amicable solutions for everyone. Okay. I don't like yeah. flicking through the book midway through the game. If someone wants to do something and none of us sat around the table have the answer to how we do it straight away. We just come up with a solution, and then at the end of the session, we'll look it up. If there's no rule for it, then we'll keep doing it our way. If there's a rule that we like more, we'll bring that in. Um, so, so you tend to run games with the rules. The rules are pretty much, they are as they are in the book, and you tend to run the game as is. Uh, less At the table, we never look anything up. So we will homebrew a rule for that session and then look it up. Okay. And figure out if our way was better or if yeah. the book's way was I, better. I bring this in here as we're discussing player types purely because this is kind of, I'm kind of hinting at Addison that there's kind of a, 
a cure for the GM here for power game. There's a cure right there. Homebrewing is your cure for a lot of power gaming issues, if I'm honest. So I'll give you an example. If you've got in a, a room, you know you've got a couple of guys who like to min-max. And let's take an extreme example. Let's say I'm running Pathfinder, right? And I've got a couple of guys who like to min-max. And that's perfectly acceptable. It's within the rules. Um, okay, fine. Go ahead. Um, I will also have some pretty strong guidelines about things that you're not going to be able to do. So it, you might find I'm really tough on what stats you actually start with. So there's no way you can start with very high stats. It's not possible. This immediately brings the power curve down without being unfair. Still get good characters. Um, I might also not allow easy access into a few of the key classes. Like I might not summon that immediately have a paladin. You have to work for that. You might not get that. So just again to within the frame of my game, bring that power curve down a little to make me feel comfortable and happy in what I'm running. And I find that a very useful, without being unfair, nice, simple sort of kind of take the bell curve off the top of the curve if you will make it a little bit more palatable for me as a gm is that something you would you know give a little bit of thought to maybe moving forward and because these guys have a power if you will i mean if you think about power gamer right, and you were giving them a score from one to three you would give them a three because the amount of um force that they can exert on a game depending on the system is quite strong yeah, it's very strong. And equally, on the opposite side, if you talk about um, like a method actor, he'd be the all you know, he'd be the Moriarty to their Sherlock, if you will. So he would be the person who's still got a lot of power, but it's more in a theatrical, backstory, interactive kind of way. So the last thing he wants is my rules. Yeah, I'll tell you what we're going to do, guys. You're a lovely method actor. Thanks for coming along for Pathfinder. I know you're going to enjoy this. I've got to immediately make some change in that game. So people who know me know full well that we're talking Pathfinder. The first thing I do is there's a lot of rules in Pathfinder. Interaction rules. You don't make rolls for persuading people. You role play it out um, and you can put your points anywhere else you want. That gives those method actors, those storytellers, a lot more power than they previously had in that system because now suddenly they can talk their way out of things and enjoy the interactions. Just thought mm -hmm. I'd share that with you. Just a thought. Yeah, I, I think there there are certain things that I do. So like I I do I have done that before with the with the with the uh, persuasion. Yeah. Somebody persuades me. Yeah. Like you're good like, for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, why? Why would I make you roll for it? Um, Absolutely. And but Go then ahead. if they're like struggling. Yeah. If they um... then if it's if it's a new player and they struggle and they're like, can I just roll for it? I'll be like, yeah, sure. Why not? Why not? Because um, I have a very similar thing to be, to Ben in terms of like, I don't like to be flicking through the book as we're playing. Like, um, I'm very the lucky. Emotion, it? Yeah. the emotion of the game. I am very lucky in the fact that uh, I have somebody called Matt Vials in my in my games a lot of the time, and he is like an Matt is incredible at rules. rules. Yeah, he, he he knows all the rules, but also as well like we we do this thing called like. I suppose it's called like it's again that thing of me being a logician like logic like i i always include the alternative flanking rule because i know from my martial arts background that the worst thing you can do is be surrounded because you are easier to hit if you are surrounded like so i will always include flanking because i know that from experience sort of thing yeah um, you bring you bring a piece of gold in and it's a lovely tip that you've just given you know there that's a, a, a real thing a gm can do is look i do the same in my game ben will know this hey ben uh we're playing for midlands uh, what's that again ben what do we do here <laughs> you know i don't i've got no no harm in referring to a person who knows the system better than me it's a perfectly valid point i think it should be used you know rely on some of your players bring them in and that can also help you when it comes to some of the player types you struggle with a bit give them a bit of you quite you know the rules really well, so I might lean on you here just to remind me of how this plays out, how this should work. Nothing wrong with it, and it but gets their buy in when you want to make some, shall we say, uh, GM caveats or changes that you feel are appropriate to the game. So that's a really great point. Thanks for that. Let's move on to a different kind of player type, the specialist. Um, we'll start with Addison here. Now, this is a person who would, it, it, just to give a feel for it, is somebody who might take a particular role. 99 times out of 100, they'll play a certain character type or a certain way nearly all the time. I can think of one person. I'm sure she won't mind me mentioning them here. That'd be Nine. She has a particular way of playing. Um, it, it's pretty consistent. She enjoys playing a particular style of character. There are variations in the way she plays them. But there is a kind of character there that she's kind of formulating in her mind that she likes to bring into different campaigns. Um, they are out there. They do exist. You do find people who love to play the ninja or the thief or the, the fighter. Um, they very much focus on that one concept that they enjoy. Do you, how do you 
do you have those players around your table? What do you think about them, Addison? Um, so I, I've I've had nine, and um, I did try to open up Horizons, and and she she did adapt really well. I was really proud of her when she did, um, because I I I just wanted to be a bit more like I just wanted to give her more because like every, like she'd always played the same thing and it kept going the same way. So I gave her something else, and then she actually thrived by it, which was really nice. Um, but I think specialists, I think as long as they aren't detrimental, it's a bit the same thing as the, as the, as the murder hobo slash butt kicker. As long as they're not detrimental, like, then there's no reason to like curb them at all. Like let them do them. Like I love monks. Like again, my martial arts background, I love martial arts films. Like like, as soon as I saw the monk art, I was like, yes. Yes first character was a monk and i will i will if i can play monk as much as i can but yeah i i i don't play very often but i i always find myself if i'm playing it, it has to be a spell cast i just enjoy the the, yeah. the, the, cle- the cleverness of trying to use the spells i enjoy yeah. that so yeah. um so i you do you man like i don't i don't care yeah. it's only when you start when i start seeing other people get like annoyed at you because you won't I don't want to say your fun's wrong because that's not true. No one's fun is wrong. Yeah. But when your fun starts impacting on everybody else's fun, yeah, then it is. We need to have, we need to, have to. We need to make a, a empire get past this and make a, a level playing field again. Is my yeah. main issue. Yeah, that's a very a very valid point. Again, we'll explore that in another video about that kind of consequence. But how do you feel about the specialist Ben? You must get them in, particularly in kind of the you know you've gone a certain route with the games you run so you will find players that kind of fall into certain player types quite a lot of the time a certain character so, class if you will yeah the the specialist doesn't bother me it, it seems to be like you're a specialist and you're something else but i think there's a very important distinction between the specialist that plays the same type of character and the yeah. specialist that plays the same character Yes, uh, yes, and that second kind can get kind of annoying if you've got the exact same character who comes back for the fifth time with it, the same it, name. I, I totally understand. That can... it, it, yeah, I would have I would have a lot of issues if you died and then you brought back a, a clone of the one that just died would concern me as a GM a lot and would kill the would rather worry me about what I'm allowing back in. But yeah, your points are absolutely valid. Great point. Uh, yeah, like if, like even if you if you change the name and like the back, like <laughs> a, a yeah, part of the back, please. It's still, the, it's still a ninja. Yeah. <laughs> I, you, if, I, it, if it's if you want to play a ninja in every, uh, it, it, sure, sure, the party can walk into fifteen ninjas. That's fine. But if they walk into the Jeff the ninja fifteen yeah. times. <laughs> Yeah, like I, the party's I, I, suddenly gonna think that maybe don't go with the, it's any like, ninjas it's like, called Jeff. Well, it's like I, I had a chat with True Story, who he, all he ever did was play rogues, and and, and that's fine. Um, and but like you said, specifically on that point, the same rogue, halfling rogue every time had to be a halfling rogue. And then when he got challenged by myself and the other players to kind of like, come on, it's time now to you know fledge your rings, let's try something different. He came back as a, a halfling fighter, right? And I thought, okay, well, this is different. But it was a fighter that specialised in all roguish skills. <laughs> uh, so, so sometimes, you know, for all the best will in the world, you know, it's a kind of a thing where you kind of just have to kind of go, okay, as you said, Addison, you know, they're obviously enjoying it. They enjoy it for a different reason. Sometimes you just kind of have to, okay, um, you know, as long as it isn't detrimental to everybody else's fun and isn't taken away from the game, and um, you know, it may be something you have to kind of draw a line under. But Again, please give them a different it, name. Yeah. What's that? Sorry, Ben. But please give them a different name. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. it's. I was I was really like nine won't mind me saying this because we've we we've talked about this openly. I, I was really mean to nine because I, I I gave her hope. I was like they're like yeah we can re we can revive your character because she was like no don't let my character die. But the person who they took it to did not know like revive. They knew reincarnate, which is yeah. different. So, so she has to so, come back as something else. That's very she good. came back as a as a ranger, yeah, like and a beastmaster ranger. So not problem. only did she have, not only did she have like a, the beast companion because Nine's very like loves animals and stuff like that. Yeah. So I was like, that will buy in. That will get buy in. 
but she she came back as a drow and like obviously drow elves are very like effeminate looking and stuff like that because they're a matriarchal society and like it was just like oh no and this was randomly rolled as well so i was like yes this is the yeah. best possible and and uh, not gonna lie th- she did quite well with it she was she was very good with it um she she adapted i think you've just got to give them i think you've got to give them that opportunity and then part like, of our job isn't it part of our job yeah. as DMs is kind of we have to sometimes it's tough love like you've illustrated a bit of tough love there you know you have to be a bit tough love with your players sometimes so i mean you don't do it first session but maybe over time you decide to take a slightly different approach to it absolutely you have to because you're helping them develop as players as well so and that's important you know we're not going to force you to change we're going to try and help you change you know yeah okay i just brilliant. want to point out that yeah. nine is a great player and it's really fun to play with uh this is oh, just like yeah, the one totally. thing that i think massively, we've all know massively helped in the current forbidden lands campaign i'm really enjoying the character concept that she's got there and that's a that's a very different i feel very different than a lot of the characters she's played i'm very enjoying nine's, nine's great if you ever played like a pokemon rpg as well so right like if you ever get the opportunity well let's it. go let's go to the opposite extreme we've talked about some of the more power gaming you know the butt kicking kind of roles let's talk about the difference between a method actor and a storyteller let's start with a method actor now um have you had experience with those around your table and if so you know how do you find them as player types give us a general overview if we start with ben because you probably see more of these kinds i would have thought with the kind of games you're running so good let's just let's just talk in silly voices all night it's like it's my favorite (laughs) thing (laughs) Right, you yeah. you pretend to be a dwarf. I'll I'll be an elven barkeep. Let's do this. You know, let's yeah. uh, genuinely my favorite part of the hobby. So I these are my I know I shouldn't have a favorite player, but these are usually my favorite players. They help develop your story, don't they? That's uh, yeah. another thing they'll often do. How what would you, what would you say about them as um, you know like a method actor? What's the biggest difference between them and a storyteller, in your view? I think a method actor is a character and a storyteller wants to tell a story about their character if that makes sense great it does so you're saying that the method actor specifically focuses on the character the backstory the mannerisms the whole performance for the method actor and the storyteller yes that's important but it's more about the grand design yeah great yeah like that addison how do you feel about method actors um, I quite like them. I've not had many, admittedly. Uh, uh, my players seem to go more towards storyteller. Like there's, there's, because the, the, I, I believe that the difference between method actor and um, storyteller is is uh, time. So, in the moment, a method actor is brilliant most of the time. Uh, Sometimes you can get a bit like, oh, I don't really want to interact. Like, I don't really want to method at like having sex with you. That's kind of weird. Um, okay, so there, a, in... You're right. You're highlighting there is the potential for this to be just as dangerous, depending on the audience, as yeah. much as a power gamer can be. So there is a yeah. danger. I'll, I'll like, talk about that in a minute. Yeah, great but, point. So yeah. In, in the scenario, they're great. But over long term, sometimes they, they struggle when they can't have that like stage. Whereas yeah. the storyteller is the opposite. Whereas they, over time, they're like, "I'm looking for this," and I will. F- they will do things over time to find that thing. Uh, but when you finally get them into that scenario, sometimes where they where they have to actually act and work for that thing that they're looking for. So maybe it's a clue to their long lost dad or something. Or again, we go back to the heist. It's it's the last bit that they need. They need this guy to agree to show them where the back door is, sort of thing. And um, they need to go through that. They've done everything else. They've checked off all the other things on the list, and then they get to this moment and they're like, and they like have a bit of a, a brain fart, and they can't quite do it because they're like, no, I'm good for the big plan. I'm good for the big plan. And I I fall into that sometimes. I'm not very good at the um. I come off as obnoxious in the um, as a player in the uh, acting space because I'm just like I just want to get this over and done with as quickly as possible, sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I agree. Both of you raised brilliant points. I'm sure people that are listening in or going to listen in on this are going to find them very valid. 
Um, you know, both these player types have a big power. The storyteller particularly can be your, it can be a fantastic fall for you as a GM. You know, there can be a fantastic fall out there. Um, amongst the players, it's sometimes like having a GM's voice around the table sometimes, having that storyteller in be very important. The method actor can sometimes be really tricky because they will sacrifice things that could be integral to the entire game but they'll do it because it's what their character would do and this can become hugely difficult sometimes for us as GMs and other players around them might struggle with that just as much as they might struggle with the power gamer. I'm going to give an example of where method acting and storytelling went too far so indulge me while I just go off on a slight tangent but it's a very important one for those listening in um I said at the beginning that you kind of go on a GM's journey like a circle. I think where I started off without boring the audience is I started off as a power gaming GM. So it was all about being, you know, lots of powers, lots of magic, lots of magical items, being very lenient as a GM, thinking that I could rely on my laurels, the skills that I had in terms of my accuracy, which everybody said was great. And I thought that was brilliant. But I realized later how shit that really is actually. Being good at ad lib is just one small skill in the grand spectrum of everything. And I can teach people that. Um, but it, you eventually go full circle. So you start off in this way, and then over time you start to... So that sometimes comes through the system choice, like Ben's got up there some interesting systems. You make some choices, GM, let's try this out. And slowly the players evolve with you. So you go to the opposite end. You know, you go to the opposite end, where you'll be in a game a bit like Forbidden Lands or Game of Thrones or Vampire the Masquerade. Very very heavy themes, very heavy tone. And... There'll come, a st- there'll come a point, I promise you, if you go the full journey, I've, I've been there three times, three different occasions I knew we were heading this way, I had to make changes, where you'll start the story off, the characters will be around the camp, they'll lit the fire, and they will, as characters, stay there for the entire three hours discussing bits of their story that happened weeks before that had no bearing on anything you actually did. Now, this might sound brilliant, because for the first time it happens, you go, wow, what a DM I am. I didn't have to say a word, look at my game, it's great. By the third session, where you've not involved at all and the game's not moved forward, they haven't even left the camp, it's time to realise you've gone too far. You've got to change, yeah? You've got to understand the balance. You as a GM have got a massive influence over how a game moves. The create, How you bring that time down, how you allow that time, the time to evolve, we will talk on those things later. So what Anderson and Ben touch on here, very invaluable to the audience listening in particularly around these guys. So what I wanted to cover there with this particular question about the focus of the players, particularly in relation to what we spoke about at the beginning, about the system, the DM and the players. We've not at any point here talked about DMing skills. That will come in the next part. Well, I want to ask you both a question now. Is DMing a talent or a skill? Ben, what's your thoughts? Definitely a skill, right? Like... You need to practice it. You're, like, I don't think anyone's is like amazing going in. I think we all had the like the first awkward few DMing sessions yeah. before we were able to knock together anything half decent. I think there is a lot you can read. There's a lot you can watch online and listen to that will like really expand it. Um, hunting for those books with actually good GM sections that aren't just the same shit you've heard a million times. I think is invaluable. It's. I think it's definitely a skill. I, I don't know how someone could be immediately talented. So I think that talents can help. Um, but I do think yeah. it's a skill that you... The act of DMing itself is, is a skill that you build on, like Ben said, you practice, and you. but you can use your other talents to help uh, make up for things that you're not very good at. So like, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, a writer. Like I, I used to write. I used to... Um, edit writing like uh, story wise so therefore I'm quite good at storytelling and therefore I didn't need to work on that bit as much whereas because um, it's something I've always been able to do like but for example organization is something that I've always been shy at so I needed to really work on that and like learn like to organize combats and social encounters and stuff like that because I would lo- when I was first that was my main concern. I was so wrapped up in telling the story that I forgot that there are 30 goblins currently attacking and you keep forgetting which goblins have gone and which goblins haven't gone. So you keep attacking the same goblin like 30 times instead of actually using all the goblins. So um, that is something I I, I had to learn and pace myself with skill-wise. 
Yeah, I think you've touched on it brilliantly, a pair of you. I, I think, you know, each of us will have talents that are either natural or something you discover as you begin to GM. There is absolutely no substitute to hours around the table for GMs. Um, if you've got any input or, you know, any kind of, you really want to have a go at GMing, then do it. Um, you're not going to find out until you throw yourself into it. And it, and it is, I'm afraid, a little bit like Marmite. You, you're going to have to go in and accept that it's hard. You know, it is really tough. But if you tell the players, I always say, just use your NPC immunity badge as a GM. Just tell everybody straight away that this is your first campaign. That buys you a lot of leeway with a lot of players. And keep telling them, because players forget very quick, just keep reminding them, this is my first campaign. This is my first campaign. This is my first campaign. Um, because... You buy yourself as much time as you need, um, and the more hours you get at the table, the better the game will go as you begin to build on your skill base, as Addison says. So don't be frightened to go for it, but equally understand, you know what? You know, it may not be for you, and that's okay. That's fine. And I think some GMs, they get very complacent and don't realize the damage that you can do if you don't really wrap yourself into those players, you know, and you'll know if you're damaging them because they won't come back to your table, right? And that's, that's as simple as it is. You'll know players will drop out all the time. So you've got to think why. You can't keep blaming them. You've got to come back and start thinking, Did what am I doing? What could I improve? Constantly keep thinking about that because in the next part, although we've not touched on it, we're going to look at GMing in a bit more detail and really give some meat on the bones of different techniques that all of these GMs do. And that will be useful. Let's thank so, you for your answer on that because I really want to touch on. Did you have something else, Ben? Yeah, touch? Sean, you've uh, DM'd for both me and Addison, right? Uh, I don't think I've ever had the privilege of uh, DMing for Addison. Actually, oh, never mind. No. I, I was going to ask I've what only, player types you thought we were. I've heard, I've heard of Addison's skills um, from other players, and I've I've heard very good things, and that's that's good enough for me. If other players are saying it's good, then that's you know you know it's good. You know that's all I'll ever say. You know people don't say it's good if it's not good. Um, before we move on. Um, do you think, uh, and I know I'm firing a question at you, Sean, and you're yeah, like, hey, do. I'm yeah, doing the interview. Yeah, do you think do. that different systems require different skill sets or focuses on different skill sets? Because when I first ran uh, Mutants and Masterminds, um, I found that almost took me back to zero because I was like, oh, my God, like this is this is good. You, you, look, think of it this way. Absolutely, it will. Because if you if you said, if I said to you tomorrow, right, I know that you don't like you know, you really struggled with Pathfinder. So if I was being honest, if, as, a, as a fellow GM to you, I'd say to you this, right? Now that I know that, it's like, it's like I'd be your kryptonite and say to you, right, you know how you're going to have to find out how good you are now? You're going to have to run a campaign in Pathfinder because you're going to have to find out. <laughs> yeah, I seriously, I'm being serious. So like for me, you know, like we say about, you know, good GMs, what good GMs really do, right? Like you kind of touched on it beautifully in that answer. I over time you realize you kind of go like I'm a great believer I, I chase what I call the grail I, I I really genuinely people that know me know this is absolutely true every performance and it is a performing art you know GMing is a performing art I get nerves every time before I GM there is not a single game I don't go in I think oh, you know this I you know I don't know if this is going to work you know I, I've got this idea and I will really doubt and I, I genuinely mean that you don't, I don't, and I, I've been GMing for years and I have those doubts, those fears, because I know how valuable that is. If I was complacent and go in, that's not performance. I'm not thriving. I'm not really putting, pushing myself. Now for some people that might work, you know, you could be in a group where they just want a certain kind of game. They're happy with what you're doing. You're happy with them and it works. And that's fine. That's rule zero. If it works, it works, you know, don't change it. Great. Good for you. Very hard to do, though, because as players change or you get, you know, drop into a convention or do something unique, a one-off or challenge like this where you're doing everything without seeing people's voices, a whole new range of skills, you have to have them and develop them. I mean, I've been lucky that, you know, I'm old core, you know, old core skills, you know. So, um, you know, we, we were, I, I literally played one session and then, the you know, a lovely GM by, by the name of Andrew, I think Ben knows this story, um, he, he, I said to him, he asked me, he came, I asked me to play, and I, at the time, ironically enough, I had, he asked me to play a character later as a monk, and I played, it was Keep on the Boardlands, I had no idea what I was playing, I, he just said it was a games club, so I went along thinking it was a board game, it ended up being role player. no idea what I was doing as a player, and at the end, he said to me, really profoundly, he said, so what did you think, Sean? I said, absolutely brilliant, thanks, Andrew, really great fun, really enjoyed it. I got a question, he said, what's that? I said, I'd like to run this next week, and he just looked at me, everybody's kind of jaws dropped, and he said, you can't run this, these books are like, you know, like this. You, you know, he looked at me, but he didn't say that. Players were looking at me like, don't be stupid. Andrew's our GM, you know. No, you know, come on, this takes months to master, you know. 
because people don't share secrets. And, and Andrew did the most amazing thing as a GM. I never forgot. Just handed me the books and said, I'll be playing in your game next week. And like, there it is. There's your challenge. So um, I learned a lot by being thrown into the fire of having the GM for another GM and getting his feedback. And his feedback was very invaluable. He was very fair with me. Um, I found that really great. So thanks for throwing that question back at me. Really, thank you, Addison. Now, let's get to system because this is where I wanted to get to tonight. Um, I can't see you now. I can only see your arm, Addison. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's, better. that's all right. So, um, look, I've got some questions about this. So, you you know, you touched on it here. System matters. The system matters. Does it, you know, does picking the rule set matter? Of course it matters. Think about it for a minute. Now, if I've got a knowledge of the players I've got in my game group and all of them are power gamers, you think Forbidden Lands is going to work for me? Do you think they're going to come back? Yeah, I mean, realistically, I mean, no matter how hard I try, it's not a min-max system. They are gonna, they might trust me as a GM and they might keep turning up because they trust me that I'm going to deliver for them. But I know the audience. So if I know my audience, I know I'm already on the back foot of success. So half of GMing skill is quickly mastering what works. I know a lot of the time GMs that are listening in will think, yeah, but I go to a games club and um, we all play fifth edition. Well, that's great. Good. You know, if that works for you, that's good. But over time, you will find that players will want to experience and GMs will want to experience new things. And fifth edition will change. We don't know what will happen in the future. What you've seen is you saw Pathfinder be fifth edition and Pathfinder was crunchy. Fifth edition is less so. Maybe the next system is far more theatrical. There's so many things that can happen in role play. So it's worth considering. So when you're thinking about system, do you really think about the system? Or is it just something you feel comfortable with? Is, is this something that as a GM Addison, I know fifth edition is your thing you're doing at the moment. You feel comfortable in that, that running that. Has it, are there challenges coming as a GM? Are you starting to think, yeah, you've been doing it for two years. Are you starting to think I need to flesh, you know, flesh my wings a little, try things out that are really outside my comfort zone to hone oh, yeah. my skills further. Yeah. So um, one of the things about mutants and masterminds is only a D20. Like that's that's the whole system. Like it's very everything. It, it's scenes. They call it scenes instead of encounters, and it's all in one d twenty. And the m- numbers can get massive, and it's about degrees and su- degrees of success and degrees of failure. Um, kind of like old, um, some of the older uh, role playing games like AD and D, where you have degrees of success, how much you succeeded and stuff like that. Um, so that was that was really interesting. And then I did a game of Power Rangers Hyperforce, which was all D6s, and had no rules because it was invented by a, a website to in in uh, cooperation with the Power Rangers uh, franchise to make an in-canon like, role-play game. So I had to take the rules from this show that they made, uh, rules on the internet, and bring it together and then make my own rules, which was quite fun. And then... Uh, I think my biggest, like you said about the Grail, my Grail game, I guess, is uh, I want to run a game of Dread. Okay. I really want to run right. a great game of yeah. Dread. The Dread, uh, for people who don't know, is a psychological horror, straight up horror game, where uh, all the checks are made via Jenga Tower, and you have to take blocks out of the tower in order to, and if you succeed. Um, by putting them on, you, your action succeeds. So I can ask you to take two or three bricks, depending on how difficult the situation is. And you can do things like knock the brick, like, like you can knock the tower over to like have a heroic sacrifice. And it sounds really fun. Um, I think the only thing is, um, that I've, uh, I was supposed to do a Halloween once, and I feel it is, it is a very atmospheric game. And mm. I think that's where I'm a bit worried about it in terms of like, can I have the right atmosphere to do it in? at the right time um because because um even if you create the atmosphere sometimes uh things things uh can break that can't they so like if i'd have done it at the club for example yeah. um uh i'm in i'm in my section of the library i darken it down i put like scre- creepy music on and everything and then somebody comes over and says oh uh guys is anybody going to the shop as somebody's making a pull it's like oh no like no not now so yeah there's um they don't mean to do it so i feel as if that's and that's very theatrical you have to fill in a survey to create the characters like it's not 
there's no standard sheet. You can make your own surveys for these characters. And the last the last question on the survey is, what is your name? Like, what is right. your character's name? So I made all these surveys uh, about this psychologist and she'd been murdered and you, you were one of her. Either, there was a victim, a patient, the secret, the affair. So basically all seven characters were linked to this psychologist in some way and it all had motive. And then it turns out it wasn't just a normal murder but yeah i just never got to run it so that's that's my system that i really want to run like that's that's something i really want to explore cool. i've never played forbidden lands so you guys yep. can talk about that i guess well we we probably will uh, but let's hear i want to hear ben's kind of perspective you're the master at this i mean you're picking systems because you're saying you're beautifully you're saying well, i'm picking these systems because i'm looking for a certain kind of player to fit what i want to do brilliant you know, it's kind of a brilliant approach. It's uh, it's kind of the uh, the classic. It might limit some of the audience that might come, but it is a very, very neat way to kind of get the kind of games you enjoy running. So yeah. system for you matters, doesn't it? System, yeah, for me, matters a lot. But my, especially with the kind of people I play with, because obviously, again, I, I curate my players. I, I invite people. People don't show up. Like, I don't put ads out. I invite people to play with me. So, um... So I've got a GM challenge for you as well. Yeah, so you've (laughs) got to think ahead now to... You've got to do something out of the box at some point in the near future. So what I want you to do is... Addison's got a challenge. He's got to run something he really doesn't want to run, just to really push his boundaries. Um, You've got to invite people into a... A small game doesn't have to be a big one. You know, one or two sessions, just to get a taster for it. And large numbers. Really push yourself on the numbers. Really go above what you would be. Oh my god, my current Forbidden Lands game is already like so many people. It's like eight that's people. Good. That, like that's it. pretty crazy. Well, um, if you're if you're you if you're used to running large numbers, then just challenge yourself. Just a challenge in yeah. that way. Would be so, super useful. with that group originally, we were running um, Shadow Run Third Edition. Which yep. anyone who's ever played Shadow Run knows that that's the crunchiest system. Like. And the, and the third edition is not streamlined at all. We were literally running it because it was the most 90s, like, themed system we could find. Like, you can have a character with, like, horns and rollerblade feet, and that's, like, a perfectly okay build. But the, the minutia that that game can go into, like, you can, ha- you can, like, mix different chemicals together, do, like, different effects, and there's, like, all these mechanical rules. Um... And we eventually were just like, let's let's just take the resolution mechanic of rolling a number of d6 based on these pools and not worry about anything else. So that's why we eventually changed over and decided to play. Well, we decided we wanted a change of pace, so fantasy game, we'll choose one that's not very rules heavy. And that's how we got to our lord and saviour there, Forbidden Lands. Um, <laughs> okay, so... So let's, system really that, does matter. That's superb. So, okay, so... it. Cut, stay with you on this, and then we'll go to Addison. Say, this is going to be the same thing. So you've got your, you've gone, you said Forbidden Lands. So what is it? The theme and tone that Forbidden Lands brings that separates it as a fantasy game from, say, Dungeons and Dragons, because it clearly is different, but they're still fancy. The theme and tone are a massive part of it, and I think all of the system is sort of built up to face into that theme and tone. Could you give for the audience listening in who so may never have seen that system, may only know 5th edition, there kind will of some be... very big distinctive differences between that and 5th edition? Yeah, there will be a review of Forbidden Lands on my channel at some point. So stick, I'll be joining you on that. Stick for... out for that. Um, yeah. But Forbidden... So in D&D 5e, you are, like, superheroes, essentially, of the fantasy world. Like, you can kill, like hordes of enemies and, and all this crazy stuff you can like resurrect people forbidden lands decides uh ah, no you can't do that your average average joe in this fantasy world trying to survive against the odds instead of um crazy super powered guys so in forbidden lands my character currently has three hit points and that's the, the max hit points he'll ever have um and like a regular sword swing, like, my regular sword swing can do, like, significantly more than that, so if I get hit with a sword, I'm out. That's, like, it. Um, so, like, Forbidden Lands, like, the whole tone of it is you're not a superhero, you're a regular dude, you can starve, you can, like, freeze to death, you can, like, uh, die of thirst? I'm sure there's a single word for that, but I I can't think of it right now. Yeah, Um, dehydration. (laughs) Dehydration, that is the one, yeah, you can become dehydrated. 
And I, I gravitate towards that system because that's like, I think in the back of my mind, I might be like the kind of, do we call it the, the tactician? Like in my mind, I think that'll allow you to be more of a tactician because instead of everyone having godlike powers, you're you essentially just maybe with a better sword arm. Uh, yeah. So that's why I kind of gravitate towards that. I kind of like the mud and blood kind of tone. Um, yeah, I, I like your approach. I think to add to it, because obviously I'm running a game in it, I think there's another part to it which is kind of really brilliant. I love the fact that the players are actually almost anti-heroes. They're vagabonds, thieves, rogues, opportunists. You know, a land has opened up and you can be some of the first to arrive, you know, and carve out whatever you want, whether it's a, you know, take over a location or an empire, you can try. Um, I love that about the game um, and with all the uh, difficulties that come because of the way that the theme and tone is set up what do you love about 5th edition Addison uh, particularly for you what is it about 5th edition that you enjoy I, I think it's 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 the opposite of what Ben has gone on about in Fiddle Band so I like that power fantasy I like that idea of yep. um, being special and being surrounded by people who are also like special and doing something like grand for example like in a world where sometimes we can feel a bit meh about ourselves and powerless and whatnot because there are lots of things out of our control especially at the minute i feel like having your friends with you to do something exceptional and being able to do something exceptional uh is uh getting a little really... tea break that's very kind yeah it's something very um it's something very important and like just it, I, I don't know there's there's a lot of customization customization options um for example what you've said ben is like uh, how or how forbidden lands has been described to me is like early colonialism basically like you you there's a land that's that's been discovered and i think it's you are the wayfinders like vikings is more of the theme you should think because colonials definitely were the bad guys. They weren't anti heroes. They were just killing any native they found. Like, it's well, more Viking than, yeah. So did Vikings. But, uh, um, but yeah, I know what you mean. So, like, but um, Troy in his homebrew world, he set us up in, in a very similar tone of, of like, um, we, were, we were these heroes, yeah, sure. But we were against the odds because we were the only people who could fight in this, like, expedition force. And there were things that we'd never seen before that we were coming up against. Like, um, for example, we all brought well, they all brought horses, didn't they? And what was the first thing the colonials learned uh, when they were settling Central America? Like, don't bring horses to the jungle; they don't like it. They die quite easily because of poisonous things. So, um, they we we had like a lot of issues in terms of like navigating this jungle and stuff like that and so i think as well D has has a bit more uh breadth that of setting and stuff like that you can do lots of different tones i like that customization as well yeah um well um very interesting now this brings us beautifully we're on to a few final points here for tonight accessibility of the two systems um i think you know fifth edition probably to the masses is far more accessible say than forbidden lands for a number of reasons um and that's not because i don't love forbidden lands as you know ben but it's just a reality of D D carries a certain name doesn't it to be honest this is the issue that you find it's very hard to get people to kind of come across and have a look um, How do you feel about accessibility accessibility wise if you're playing with people who have been watching critical role and know and I've, I've done a bunch of research and know that they want to get into the hobby that specific way, then yeah, 5th edition's got the, like, the, D&D's the name brand, like, yeah. it's the yeah. the Henry Hoover of, of RPGs, like, everyone has heard of it. But um, my my current player group of of, of people, um, none of them had, had really played RPGs before at all, so <laughs> they were much more susceptible to learning it, and they've picked it up way quicker than I think I could have taught fifth edition because there's a lot of specific minutiae in in fifth edition. Oh, it I comes totally with the customizing, it. which yeah. is is really good. It's it's not a a negative about that system, but I think that makes it harder to learn than 
Forbidden Lands, which is you kind of need the resolution mechanic, and like that's kind that's of it. it. Yeah. He raises a great point. I, I will allow Addison to come in in a moment. I just want to reinforce what Ben said. I mean, I know this is both systems incredibly well, and I can definitely say it's very easy to get a player into Forbidden Lands very quickly and immediately get the theme and tone without me having to explain a lot. It's really crystal clear once you see the limitations that exist, but equally the opportunity. That's what's so clever about Forbidden Lands. The characters may be this, but there's an opportunity. I quite like that. It, it goes down a human psyche for me, which I very much enjoy as a GM. My instincts are to overload them with 30 goblins, but I realise that's not going to fly here in Forbidden Lands. I've got to be far more clever at how I deliver the material. But we can come back in here because you brilliantly highlight something very good because, you know, you said that 5th edition can probably be fitted to any single theme and tone, and I would argue that is, that is not actually 100% factually true. I agree that it can be to a large degree, but can you really use 5th edition for, for sci-fi with any kind of confidence that the system works realistically? You can say you can, but it wasn't built for it. How do no. You, how do you no. feel about... I mean, it really works well as a fantasy game. I think that's... It's it's beautiful. Because it comes from... That's where it comes from. That's where the hobby is based off D&D. &D, and that's, it's bare bones when you strip back 5th edition. It is D&D &D at the heart. And I'm delighted that they've gone back this way where it's a little bit more... The power has been given more back towards the GM, okay? Because if you think about 5th edition and you consider Pathfinder that came before um, as the most popular, um, Pathfinder really puts the, the power in the player's hands, mm. if you think about it. 5th edition, a lot more, you have more control, don't you, as the GM, which is really a welcome return. In my, welcome return for that. But in Forbidden Lands, absolutely, as the GM, I've got a lot of control. There's no two ways about that. I have a lot of control how the system will, will play out. So tell us a little bit more about the accessibility and th those kind of points. How do you feel about the I, I think Ben Ben makes a good point in terms of, like, there is a lot of minutia. Um, and there is that thing of, like, there is so much media now around Dungeons & Dragons specifically. Like, yeah. you, you mentioned Critical Role, which... Hit the, has hit mainstream hype because of its Kickstarter that has broke absolute records. Uh, you've got uh, Acquisitions Inc. that happens at PAX every year. You've got uh, there's so much media now surrounding Dungeons and Dragons that it becomes more accessible because more people know it. It's no longer this hidden thing, like in certain basements in certain neighborhoods yeah. with certain nerd councils like st sat there. Yeah, I, right. I came through the era where I had people who thought I was the devil's son. Yeah, exactly. No, I and mean, now... I genuinely, they must have thought he goes out early in the morning and doesn't return till very late at night. And I even heard rumours he, he actually role-played a game in a churchyard, for God's sake. The man's insane. No, yeah. I was trying to capture the theme and tone, and the only way I can do that is the middle of the night. I needed the players to visualise this. <laughs> you know. But, of course, at the time, you look back and you think, yeah, that was pretty potty, but it was a great idea. I refereed in a castle because it was fun for the players to see the grand theatrics so you know all these things are relevant you know it's the same as putting music on in the background or using jenga tower to create that immediate suspenseful moment no matter how steady someone's hand is in a critical moment you've got to remove three blocks i mean that's that's a powerful mechanic that i really you know i totally get and understand it really gravitates to me it's the same thing as me using an actual lock and handing it to a player and a pick and saying here you go you said you're a thief Open this one for me. You know, it's the same thing. It buys the buy-in. So you raise a brilliant point. So yeah, very much so about the accessibility. Um, so coming back then, because we want to bring this to a final point, then take any questions that people might have or any questions you have as well on the what we've done tonight. Um, you can probably see if we examine everything we've been through, we've been through um, about what we what we agree we you know where we put our power if you will the system the players or the gm where our power lies as gms we've talked around the players the player types their influences on our games how we focus or don't focus on what we struggle with or do do not struggle with what we define as a dming you know is dming a talent or a skill and i think we're all consensus it's a skill but there are talents involved and we've come to system and we can now see that although system is in the background ben's beautifully his systems are sitting behind him it has a massive influence on the players around the game you could argue that if you before you even run a game i mean give you an example i might be a brand new gm never having run a game i might put a very good flyer up 
at a local gaming store. I might look the part, sell the part. I know exactly what I'm doing. I actually have no experience at all. Just read a lot, looked at a lot of videos. Um, I'm going to get an audience to come to that table. Definitely. Because it's D&D. Um, I've advertised it well. But that doesn't mean it's going to go well. Do you, see what I mean? Do you know what I mean? And it depends on now whether I've got those plethora of skills and abilities to understand quickly the players and what's not working and how I'm going to tweak it so that it's going to work for me as a game, no matter what I use. So how do you feel about now that in the grand relationship to this, Addison, thinking about the whole concept that we've talked about tonight, because you had no idea what was coming, none of them did. Um, how do you feel in relationship to this? Has it been a little eye-opening in some ways? Has that been useful? Oh uh, yeah, I think I think it's interesting. It's always interesting to hear from your peers, like as a, as a team. <laughs> I'll get back as, to the as, coffee as, in a minute. Hang on. Well, no, you, I, I, we we're peers. We 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 yeah. work together in in this space in the loom in 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 D dots when we went there, and um, we work together to bring about a community and. Yeah. Um, as a, a, from my teaching background as well, we do that a lot as well. We listen to our peers and we see what they have to say and we learn from it and we take what we can from it. So yeah, and like listening to you guys about these new systems, I've never really experienced. Um, it's really interesting because now I can go. So I now know that if I ever sit in one of Ben's games, if he ever invites me, because he's because it's a it's a private event, as he's as he's pointed out. Um, we get beer. I'm, it's I'm, great. It's it's a it's a it's a theatrical thing. He's very much there's a resolution mechanic in order to make sure things happen, but it's a theatrical thing. You're very theatrical as well, Sean. So I've heard, and you you like you said, you throw at like real life challenges at people because you feel like it's interesting. I I use my i i tell stories from a character's point of view and i try and involve them so it's it's we can take lots of things away from this i think it's really good uh, absolutely because i am always learning if people don't understand that even if you're at a table in a in a games club you should be one eye on your table one eye on whatever people are doing you should always be aware of what the other gms are up to because you can learn so much from them mm. I, i've met a chap who um a guy called tony tony willett and I will, will say this without a shadow of a doubt. Um, we we got on really well. We both approached GMing completely differently. We're, we're like yin and yang, completely different opposites to the way we approach it. But we have common ground, absolute common ground that we absolutely agree on. But we come at it from a completely different perspectives. What Tony's brilliant at, and um, I massively love this, and um, it's something I'm working on. Like you said, a brilliant part to what you came up with tonight. Both of you have said some great things. But particularly this, where you said, you know, you're masking, you kind of like all good GMs, what they do is they know really, they assess themselves all the time. We don't need players to tell us we've done a bad job. We know, right? We don't. We do honestly genuinely know when it's not going well. We beat ourselves up on, on stuff that the players probably don't even worry about. So we have a tendency to beat ourselves up, which is unnecessary sometimes as GMs. And we will fixate on things that perhaps no one else knows we're not happy about. So we, we have a tendency to do that. I don't know if you do, but I certainly do. Oh, yeah, and, totally. You yeah. know, and um, I've learned through Tony. Tony brought a brilliant thing where one day I sat because he said to me, look, I, I've watched your games. And I, I, we were in a gaming club, and I, I've seen him running games. I, he caught my eye the moment I went in the room. And the reason he caught my eye was because you were mesmerized with what this guy was doing, right? He was different. And um, you couldn't help but find the way he delivered his voice. You know, you, you give me... Give me Patrick Stewart in a GM's head. Yeah, this is, a, you know, he had that, you know, King Richard III theatrics, right? The kind of stuff that you just think, wow, this is amazing. I mean, at one point during the performance he put on, I remember him chucking this chair down and walking off as this character walked off. And he was literally in the character for that moment. And you could tell how much it mattered to him. And then he had to bring himself back and then he was back into the GM. And, and I thought, fucking hell, this guy's good, you know. And I thought, we've got to talk. I need to learn some of this. So we started talking, and he wanted some of the things I was doing. It was like this great trade-off. Like, he was telling me, what do you, how do you do this? And, how, you know, this is what I do. And we were kind of magpieing, which is what GMs do. They kind of feed off each other, you know. There'll be things that we all do maybe we don't need to talk about. But there'll be things that each of you do. I'm going, yeah, you know, I, I kind of need to do that. 
So it, there's nothing wrong with that. So people listening in, you know, don't think for one minute we're not learning. You know, I always say all the time, you're you're perfectly a good example of it, Addison. You're always, as a GM, a student in life. If you're not learning every time you come to that table, if there's not something you're taking away every time, um, you really don't care. And that's fine. If you if you just want to run a serviceable game and that's okay to you, that's fine. But I personally, me, I want to come back each time and try that bit more. It really drives me on to try the best I can every single session because the players are your legacy. You know, they're the things that will be your foot soldiers for the game you run. No matter how much you think it's great, they're your storytellers. They're the people who go off and tell other people if it's any good. Trust me. You know, yeah. and that's what happened. You know, so that's that's part of it. So questions, uh, gentlemen, any questions from you tonight on what we covered tonight or any questions from the field out there that people want to chip in on? Have we had anything come through? I've got nothing personally or nothing on, on the loom itself. So I'm did guessing... I've, did either of you have any questions that you wanted to throw in? No matter what it's on, whatever subject, please throw them in. We will come back. I mean, if you're open for it next week, if it has to be two weeks' time, it'll be two weeks' time, whatever works for you guys. Might might need to be two weeks' time for me. Then got... we'll go we'll go to we'll do two weeks same time if that's okay with you. Works for me. And we'll pick back up where we've left off. But any questions tonight, anything you want to throw out, anything that's is it can be anything. As we have the end of the video. Uh, I've not got any, but if people want to leave like a comment, then we'll get to them next next time. Yeah, great. In two weeks, yeah. Did you have anything at all, Addison, that you wanted to throw no, in? I just wanted to thank you and say thanks. It's, it's been a pleasure. I, I like talking to other people about what they do and how they do it and, like, and reflecting on my own practice as well. Because I think sometimes, like you said, we re-reflect by ourselves and we beat ourselves up about a lot of things but then we tell other people they're like i don't they they like look at you like you you did fine what's your problem sort yeah. of thing so i yeah. think that's a really good and healthy thing to do especially at the moment when we're all a bit disconnected yeah it's really it's very important to learn the value i i i struggled a lot with this early on so it's worth leaving it at this point because next week we are going to well two weeks time we're going to focus on more pacific gming skills Okay, so I'm going to come at you with some very interesting Pacific skills and talk around your experiences of those skills because that's going to be very relevant for the audience listening in. But I really struggled because I'm a very heavy critic of my own stuff, very heavy. I mean, nobody can be more critical than myself. Um, and I've learned the value in the last few years of actually not doing this. Just stop beating yourself up as a GM over minute stuff that has no relevance. If your players have got, like you illustrated, Ben, you know, if you're not sure of a particular mechanic, okay, we'll figure it out on the fly. At the end of the session, we'll look it up if it's critical. Totally get it. You know, for me, that makes perfect sense because unless it was going to really have an impact of somebody losing their life or it yeah. was a completely, they really felt that I had misjudged something and they wanted to challenge me with, hey, you haven't considered this. Okay, I'm fine with that. That's not a problem at all. Throw the challenge in. But Otherwise, let's save it to out of the game because it's really got no bearing on the overall result. And it's the same as being overcritical. Um, just as GMs, don't fixate, particularly if you're new, don't worry too much about the performance. Just get the hours at the table. The performances will start to come themselves. You'll feel more comfortable and you'll find your players will be your biggest supporters. You have to just believe in yourself. The most important thing, the hardest thing to do is just keep trying. Uh, it's, you have to develop a thick skin, elastic band mentality as a GM, because I can tell you there is no doubt that you will run into any of these player types. Some of them you will find difficult. Um, some of these players you will not necessarily get along with. You will get challenges over ye over years. You know, I've had every challenge you can imagine and some interesting ones that people would never have thought would ever come. Um, it's how you handle them. You know, challenges will come. Um, don't see them as negatives. Just see them as opportunities to improve. And if you take them the right way, really, honestly, your games will continue to grow. So I just wanted to leave that there. Um, every, has anyone got something to plug? I know Addison will probably want to plug his podcast and where people... Oh, yeah. Um, we're, we're currently um, experiencing a, a few tech issues. I was going to ask you about that, Ben. But um, the Pod of Many Things is a, is a podcast. Me, Leon, and Troy from this community run. I do plug it every now and then so yeah well, I, pretty, people I, find I, it. I have listened i have listened into some of their excellent and um yeah at any point you ever want somebody to jump in i'll be happy to jump in on any subject you guys want to talk about without a shadow of a doubt because it's brilliant 
Love Thank the you. Name. Love the name as well. It's a great name. Yeah. Where can people Thank find you. it and download it? Uh, so it's on YouTube at the moment, and we're currently working on trying to RSS feed properly to Podbean. Oh, but uh, it's it. mainly on YouTube. It's mainly on YouTube, and then we're going to do audio only on Podbean, and then free that Spotify, Apple, and all that jazz. Well worth checking out. So do do please podcast, check it out. Yeah. Definitely, the more more likes and definite things you you know have a look at it for God's sake, please do because it really helps. You Thank you. Want Say something about your YouTube channel, or do you still use your YouTube channel? Or no, I don't. I mean, I, I'm at a point where I, I used the YouTube channel back in the day. And we built a community around it. Um, it. It's there as a kind of a, a, a sort of a, a, a memento, a Stonehenge of the past. You know, it's there for people <laughs> to have a look at um, new GMs. I find that it's a good way they contact me personally through it, and then I tend to work with them. I've I found I've been mentoring a lot of different people over. The which I really enjoy. So there's some new people here, like we've got Thomas in the community, in this community who's been very sought help advice. And I've, I've tried to um, give him a little without overloading him. Um, and I've tried to get him to realise, which hopefully he listens in on this, I'm not telling him much. I'm kind of steering him, but without telling him. I'm kind of saying, yeah, it sounds good. Try it. I'm not telling him what to do because it's not my place to tell him whether it'll work or not. You've got to find out the time at the table. It's not me being horrible you've got to jump in there's no point i don't know what's going to happen when it interacts with the players none of us do you've got to throw yourself in there and have some fun you've got great ideas believe in yourself now and going after those hours at the table because thomas i believe in you you can do it you write interesting stuff so go for it so um i know you've got you're interested in me getting involved in a review of yeah, Forbidden Lands. Lands I'm yeah. excited to do that with you. That's going to go that... on the Flickering Torch YouTube channel. There's one video on there currently that's how to play Shadowrun 3rd edition. So, I mean, there's probably going to be more on there soon now that I've got some cool light setups. Excellent. Well, I look forward to getting involved with you. We'll have to network with you, Ben. Oh, doing a bit of I'll give you my business card. You can talk to my people and I'll talk yeah. to you. Yeah. Got it. All right. Well, thanks for listening or watching everyone, depending on where you're seeing this. Uh, we'll we'll see you in two weeks' time for for the next one, the next part. Bye, Bizzle.